the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In what does glory consist? If we think about it, what is it that gives us glory? And for the most part, we must admit it is what we do, especially when we've done something good and we've done something well. So for instance, if we take famous examples, the great composers, Beethoven, his glory is his music. Handel, his glory is his music. If we think of the artists, Michelangelo, is not his glory the Pieta or the Sistine Chapel, the Last Judgment? Architects, their glory is the buildings that they have designed and have been built. But for us, who are not great composers, or composers for that matter, or artists or architects, what is our glory? The glory we have comes from what we do. A general, his glory is the fact that he has won, he has a victory, he's won a great battle, the war. The discoverer, he's found something new. This is his glory. But for us, our glory is essentially what we do and what we have done well. What is God's glory? And the psalmist answers the question. God is glorified in his works. So, the way God receives glory is, or rather, the way we receive glory is the same as the way God receives glory. And since everything God does is good, God receives glory in everything that he does. And so we can ask the question, another question, what is God's greatest glory? Or what is his greatest work? Is it the creation? The creation of heaven and earth? Is that his greatest work? And the answer is, no, it's not. His greatest work, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, is the incarnation, when God became man. There can be no greater work than this. Now, when God decided that he would join human nature to a divine person, the incarnation, when the second person of the Blessed Trinity would become man, when the word would be made flesh, at that very moment, he decided also on who the mother of his son would be. And so we can see that our Blessed Lady is to be included in the greatest work that God has done. God is glorified in all of his works. And he receives the greatest glory in his greatest work, the incarnation, and with it, the divine maternity, that a woman would be the mother of God. What an incredible thought. What a mystery. And when we recite the rosary, these are the mysteries that we should be contemplating. The third joyful mystery, the birth of our Savior. The first joyful mystery, the Annunciation or the Incarnation. These are the things that we should ponder whilst we recite the Ave Marias. But if we start at the beginning, because the Incarnation, we are told by Saint Paul, 
occurred at the fullness of time. At the fullness of time, God sent his only son, born of a virgin, born of a woman. If we go back to the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In particular, he created our first father, Adam. Created out of the slime of the earth, yet with the very breath of God in his nostrils, so that Adam became a living being. A living being in as much as he was a spiritual being. And with the breathing of the divine breath, God gave to Adam all the natural knowledge that he needed. Just as he gave to each and every angel the natural knowledge that it needed. He also gave to Adam a glimmer, an insight into supernatural things. In other words, what was to be his final destiny? Union with God. Perhaps even an inkling that he would become like God. But this desire to be like God can only be achieved in the way that God intends it. After all, St. John tells us in his prologue, the first chapter, that he gave them power to become sons of God. That's us. That we could become children of God. That's us, each and every one of us. But this desire, this insight, was corrupted by the tempter who came and suggested that we could become like God himself our way. As it says in the song, and this, in fact, the um, national, national, the anthem for hell is, I did it my way. As Christians, as believers, we are to do it God's way. Those who choose to do it their way end up in hell, a very real place. And so the deceiver came and suggested to Eve that she could become like God in her own way. And sadly, Eve believed and brought disaster on all of us, all of her children. There is something else about glory. When a work has been destroyed, whether it be a building, or whether it be a painting or a sculpture, what can the artist or the creator do? Well, he could just cast it aside and create a new one, make another one. Yes, but it wouldn't be the same. But a really great, a master craftsman, he would take what has been damaged and he would repair it and make it even better. Isn't that so? That's what a master craftsman would do. He would take what has been damaged, repair it, and make it better. Think of a dress. A seamstress has made a dress. It's beautiful. It gets, it gets torn. If she's really talented, then she would take that tear and incorporate it in the dress, making it even more beautiful. And that is what God did to our world. It had been destroyed, it had been damaged by Adam's sin. And so God, the master craftsman, decided not to destroy it or to throw it away, but rather to repair it and to make it even better. And to do this, he determined on the incarnation. He himself, the eternal God, would put on mortal flesh would suffer, would die, 
would rise again and he would have a glorious body. And not content with this, he would give to all those, all of us, who believe in him, the promise that we would have glorious bodies as well. So that the old Adam, which is still in us, would be repaired. And how could that take place? With the seven sacraments. These would repair what is damaged in the old Adam, in all of us. So our sins are forgiven. We are reborn in baptism. And when we fall into sin, we can repair that through the sacrament of confession and the anointing of the sick. We will be strengthened along the way with the Holy Eucharist. We would be strengthened also with the sacrament of confirmation and have the Holy Spirit accompany us on our journey. Our works would be sanctified, hence marriage, and we would have ministers, the priesthood. And all of this is repairing what had been damaged by the first Adam. The second Adam has elevated us. So, whereas before we were merely servants of God, now Christ says, I call you servants no longer, but friends. And more than friends, he has made us children of God, co heirs with himself, destined for eternal life, to rule with the angels, to be eternally happy. Most religions, which are natural, natural religions, there's only one true religion, and that is Christianity. And within Christianity, there's only one true version, the Catholic Church. This is the church Christ founded. This and no other. Most natural religions have some myths, legends, of gods becoming man. But in all of them, these gods are merely copies of wicked human nature. So whether it be in the Greek, Zeus, who puts on human forms to seduce women, or Apollo, or whoever, these are never real gods. But the idea remains, perhaps it was given to Adam, that one day God would become man so man could become God. God himself declared in the prophet Jeremiah that he would do a new thing upon the earth. And he says it specifically that a woman would encompass a man. This is Jeremiah 31, 22. What does this mean? A woman will encompass a man. Well, let us see. There is in all of us a desire to be great. We would like to be important. We, each one of us, thinks of ourselves as special. And we are. We are unique. There isn't another person in all the universe, throughout all the ages, like us. There is no one like us in creation. We, each one of us, is unique. Isn't that a wonderful thought? We're a universe all by ourselves. We all desire to be great, but we recognize not all of us will be great. There'll be some will be greater and some will be less. Few of us are content to remain at our level, our station. In our thoughts, 
success is to go up. That is good. As long as we do it God's way. Let us take an example. James and John came to our Lord whilst the Lord was going to Jerusalem to be crucified. They thought that the kingdom would appear at any moment. They said, Master, we would like you to do us a favor. What is it? Grant that we will sit on your left hand and on your right hand in your kingdom. And the Lord said, you do not know what you're asking for. And then he asks a further question. He said, can you drink the chalice I'm about to drink? And they said, we can. He said, very well. You will drink it. But for the seats on the left and the right, they are not mine to give to you. They belong to those for whom they have been prepared. The Lord didn't say for whom. But he recognized that this desire for excellence to, to climb up had to be some way redirected. And so he says, the way to do it is through suffering. Drink the chalice. So he teaches all of us that true greatness lies in suffering. How many of us like to suffer? I don't see any hands. We don't want to be great? Not that way, not God's way. You want to be great your way, right? God's way is through suffering. Not even the angels wanted to stay at their level, or some of the angels didn't want to stay at their level. One of them said, I will ascend to the heavens and I will place my throne above the throne of God. And there was no place found for him in heaven. He was cast down, the great serpent. So there is a desire for greatness. Loneliness is the opposite. What is another word for loneliness? And the answer is humility, which perhaps comes from the word humus, which means earth. And this humility is not a natural virtue. It's a supernatural one. It is where a person submits his or her will to that of another. All of us are called to be humble by submitting our will to God, God's will. And who is it who submitted her will absolutely to God? And the answer is, she who said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. The Lord wills it, and she obeys. And so she gives us an example of humility, of perfect humility. Yet, she also said, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. So humility doesn't mean that we deny what we are. On the contrary, humility is an affirmation of what God has done in us. That he has created us unique. And in this, Our Lady excels because the Eternal Father had determined that she would be the mother of his only son. And the son, he would show the greatest act 
of humility by becoming man. Because there is no one greater than God. Is there? Nothing is greater than God. Yet, as St. Paul tells us, have this in mind that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, emptied himself to become a slave. And being humbler yet, he accepted death. Death on a cross. And so we have this act of humility demonstrated to us by God himself. He calls each and every one of us to imitate it. Have this in mind. God has created each and, us, each and every one of us uniquely. There isn't another clone of us. There is no copy of us. There is no other person in all of creation like us. He has given each of us a place. He himself said so. When Thomas said, Lord, where are you going? He said, you know the way to place I'm going. He says, how do we know the way? We don't know where you're going. I am the way. And he said, the Lord said, I am going to prepare you a place. When I have prepared the place for you, I will come and take you so that you can be where I am. This is our destiny, to arrive at that place. And we cannot do it our way. The only way to arrive at the place prepared for us before the foundation of the world is to do it God's way. And God's way is the road of lowliness, of humility. May Mary most holy, who is the exemplar of true humility, teach us to be truly humble and to want nothing other than to do God's most holy will. In the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria.